Welcome, everybody, to the session. Um, it's, it's titled African Perspectives on Agroecology, and it's linked to a book that we were hoping to launch today, but of course books are never predictable, and it's still <laughs> at the in-copy sort of editing stage. But um, many of the participants in the book, there were 33 contributors, are, are here on stage today, so actually not many, a small proportion of the 33 are here today. Um, and it's, it's really a great pleasure to, um, to, to I think, listen. Do you, you will agree with me that it will be a great pleasure to listen to many of them who have very different takes on this topic of agroecology. And the book, I think, is quite novel in that it, it really tries to bring together a range of different perspectives from sort of activists through to policymakers, scientific uh, communities, as well as farmers, um, but with a critical perspective on what's happening in, in the agricultural space um, across many African countries and agroecological solutions to, to try and address some of the crises that we face. Um, we have a, a particular focus on seed, um, and the knowledge systems that are associated with seed, because uh, you know, seed is, is so much at the kernel of, of life. It is life. Uh, it embodies life, it embodies power uh, and culture. Um, but we also know that, that seed is under siege, and we'll hear from um, several different presentations in different spaces how, how that's taking place. So, without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce the first speaker, who's Brittany Kesselman, who's a postdoc within the um, Bioeconomy Research Chair at GCT. And she's going to start making the connection between agroecology and colonization. Over to you, Brittany. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as Rachel mentioned, I'm Brittany, and I'll be talking about the coloniality of the South African food system. Uh, I was jokingly referring to this presentation earlier as um, if coloniality is the problem, is agroecology the solution? Uh, but since I probably can't answer that, I didn't call it that. Um, so basically the key concept for this presentation is coloniality, um, which we distinguish from colonization, uh, which is the event in which foreign rule is imposed, whereas colonialism is that broader process of transformation of social relations between the colonizer and the colonized. And then coloniality is what we are still reckoning with today in the current moment. So those long-standing patterns of power that emerged as a result of colonialism, but which continue to define everything uh, in the current moment, long after the end of colonial administrations. And so in the case of South Africa, uh, these patterns of capitalist racial and patriarchal power that were put in place under colonialism remain in place today and continue to underpin the food system. So it's important to note that we are not talking about a single pre-colonial indigenous food system in South Africa. We're talking about many different food systems, uh, which different people with different cultures uh, had in different areas of the territory that have different climates, geography, plants and animals, and so forth. Um, I'm drawing from historical materials here, as well as from uh, interviews with traditional knowledge holders. Um, but there's a very uh, limited knowledge of what pre-colonial food systems looked like. Um, and while the practices may have differed significantly, there are some commonalities between South African indigenous food systems and others in other parts of the world that are largely about the values and the worldviews that underpin them. So things like an emphasis on communalism or collectivism, whether it's uh, collectively held resources or collective work and communal eating, um, extensive knowledge of plants, animals, and natural cycles in a way that most of us, especially in urban areas, do not have, uh, a very limited production of waste, and that was something that early Europeans arriving here frequently commented on, how indigenous people didn't waste any part of an animal, of course, the Europeans were leaving mountains of carcasses in their wake. Um, a system based on generosity, hospitality, reciprocity. Uh, so these same Europeans would arrive in a new area and be welcomed with milk or porridge or the gift of a cow um, anywhere they went, even though they came with guns. Um, 
and then a sense of interconnectedness and a spiritual connection with the natural world, which tended to be enacted through ritual, ceremony, things that connected people and their ancestors to the land and the natural rhythms. Um, and those kinds of values that underpin the indigenous food systems are very much aligned to the sort of principles underlying agroecology, um, especially at its sort of most broad uh, interpretation of agroecology, for instance, by an organization like La Via Campesina, but the way that agroecology is often sort of brought into South Africa and uh, distributed through NGOs and other networks is not necessarily quite as expansive. And so then, uh, in 1652, along comes Jan van Riebeck, uh, on behalf of perhaps the world's first corporation, the Dutch East India Company, and establishes a garden here to supply ships with food as they pass through on the spice route. So food was really at the center of the colonial project from the very beginning. Um, and that went with a violent land seizure, uh, denial of access to food and water resources and everything that was part of a food system. And as uh, the boundaries of the colony expanded and as Europeans moved further inland, this continued through commandos, uh, which were allegedly protecting property and borders, but in fact were massacring people, seizing land and cattle, and then enslaving indigenous people. Um, and then when the British took over in the early 19th century, uh, the wars that they staged in the Eastern Cape against the Amakosa deliberately employed a strategy of interfering with foodways so preventing planting and burning crops so that they would starve people into submission. So there were very deliberate and clear attacks on indigenous foodways from the very beginning, as well as more indirect attacks through things like uh, imposing taxes, um, which forced people into the cash economy and into labor for Europeans, um, as well as the disruption of knowledge transmission the embodied experiential learning that was involved in indigenous food systems was interrupted when people were engaged in migrant labor or when uh, missionaries took children to their schools. Uh, so in the place of those indigenous food systems that were based on uh, ideas like collectivism and uh, reciprocity, then the colonial food system that is imposed in their wake is based on profit, again, for the Dutch East India Company. It was the entire point of European settling here. Uh, and on the needs of the empire rather than the local population. So food was produced for export or for ships and not for the people. And it required forced labor to work in the large plantation style uh, farms that they established. So whether those were enslaved people from elsewhere or captives or indentured people from the area, um, they were farming mostly European crops or Eurasian crops, not indigenous crops. Uh, and that grew out of the Eurocentrism uh, which the colonizers brought, which saw all things European as superior and therefore also more marketable uh, in terms of profit. So the contemporary South African food system, um, or what many of us refer to as the contemporary South African food crisis, uh, looks pretty much the same. Um, so we see the same patterns of land distribution uh, that were established under colonial times in terms of large plantation scale farms in the hands of an elite few. Uh, the system remains profit-oriented. It was extremely obvious during COVID lockdowns when nearly half the population could not afford to eat, but the largest retailers continue to report profits during that time. Uh, it continues to produce for empire, which is now world markets. So about 90% of fruit produced in this country is exported, while large numbers of children are malnourished. And in the food sector, it is one of the most uh, dangerous and low-paying sectors of work of any sector in the economy. So perhaps not enslaved, but very close at this point, especially in agriculture, but also in processing and retail. And even the forms of disruption that began with colonialism uh, continue to this day for those who have managed to hold on to some aspects of traditional foodways until today. So there are farm evictions, forced removals for extractive industry projects, um, continuing loss of access to wild foods as places are privatized or developed. So the same systems and structures remain in place and that's what we mean by coloniality. And this system, of course, is extremely uh, toxic to the majority of people and planet, produces unhealthy foods, malnutrition, diet-related diseases, uh, produces pollution and greenhouse gas emissions and food waste, 
and the harms of the system are very disproportionately distributed, so we have a small elite capturing immense wealth from the system, and then women, black people, and the poor, in other words, the majority in this country, uh, are harmed by it. And so that is the system, and that is the context into which some of us come with agroecology as a potential solution, and I think um, there are many ways in which the values of agroecology uh, and the principles and the practices do contribute to solving some of these harms. Um, but we have to keep in mind that these are more than 400 years worth of harms and very deep patterns that we're trying to address and uh, overcome. And so I think above and beyond just agroecology, we need to be decolonizing the food system. Um, and if we look at decoloniality as a restorative recovery project, in other words, it's not about simply switching back from bread to sorghum. Um, it's about really healing the people and the land from the harms of colonialism. So we're seeing some seeds, some hints at this kind of a process in things like the Amadiba struggle, struggle that we heard about from Cromwell this morning, where people are saying no to extractivism in their territory and protecting traditional foodways. Uh, things like farmers who are um, saving and swapping traditional seeds outside of the commercial seed sector, um, and elders who do have this knowledge, who have received it, and who are continuing to pass it along. So if we can incorporate a decolonial approach into our agroecology and really center indigenous knowledge, um, then I think it can be a part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brittany, for setting the context so well with a wonderful presentation. I'm going to ask Mvu to give his input, and we'll take a set of questions following, following Mvu. So Mvu, is, this is your home ground, isn't it? So I don't think I need to introduce you. You can introduce yourself. <laughs> yeah, actually, I should, I should welcome you here. Uh, I, I live and work here at uh, Howard College uh, in the Development Studies uh, Department, which is just across the, the, the pathway. Um, and I, I also, I'm also a practicing farmer in, uh, in Richmond, in Paten in Richmond. So that's what I'm going to be presenting about uh, this afternoon. So I'm profoundly grateful to be here uh, today. Uh, as I said, this is my usual stomping ground. Um, but I'm really delighted to be with uh, fellow travelers and fellow thinkers around the question of agroecology and freedom. And I am really grateful to you, Rachel, for organizing this panel, and also for the great work that you do, pulling all the intellectual work together around agroecology here in, in Zanz. And, and Brittany, thank you for that you know, presentation that sort of really plays well into what I'm going to say, because uh, I'm talking about, in the work that I'm gonna present, about the, the place of conquest, which you called coloniality, and, and how agroecology can be a part of the struggle against, uh, against uh, the, 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 the decolonization of the food system. Now to my presentation. Uh, I begin my public engagements with this uh, statement of faith taken from the poet Amy Cizé. My mouth shall be the mouth of those calamities that have no mouth my voice, the freedom of those who break down in the prison holes of despair. My mouth shall be the mouth of those calamities that have no mouth. My voice, the freedom of those who break down in the prison holes of despair. Uh, I love this line because there is a lot in it, uh, more, than what, more than I know what to do with it, especially these diets, silencing speech, Calamity, freedom, prison, despair, and hope. Calamity, the casera logic of the present as opposed to the idea of freedom. This form the fulcrum of the work that I've been doing or pursuing for the last decade uh, or so, especially the centrality of plants in the calamitous history of this place still called South Africa and the lessons and pathways that plants and those who are marginalized by the system offer to help us imagine a different world. 
ideas to postpone the end of the world in Donna Haraway's uh, beautiful phrasing. So I live and, and work in a small community called Pateni, as you can see there. I, I'm, just showing, I'm just showing pictures. I've been told that it's better to just show pictures and not say too much, because pictures tend to you know, convey messages better than we do. So this is where I was born and raised. Uh, went to school there and lived there. I still live there in that community now. I migrated from Durban three years ago, uh, just before the pandemic. And this is where I settle. So as you can see, this is Pateni. The place is called Pateni. Uh, just outside the town of Richmond, about 90 minutes from here. Uh, I drove, I, I slept there last night, by the way. So, um, yeah, so my presentation on conquest, agroecology, and freedom centers around the work that I've been doing there over the last three years as a farmer and as a thinker also. I think I'm a thinker while I'm there, <laughs> observing and trying to learn from what people are doing in order to try and see what it says about the current state of affairs in this country. So in 2019, we relocated there with my family, and we've been part of a small group of agroecological farmers in Pateni, and my presentation today is about, about that kind of work. So about Pateni. So the vast majority of people who live here in this space um, would have been propelled to Pateni by multiple waves of calamity. And I would say maybe the first one would be the land dispossession that took place in the 1950s and 60s uh, along the Umkomazi River, where there is fertile land and black people were removed there and forcibly moved to Pateni. And it's congested, as you can see. Um, a lot of people living in a really small area. And, and so there isn't a lot of land. So that's one, one, that was the first wave of calamity. I would say that the second wave of calamity was the political violence that Pateni and Richmond are so well known for in the 19, 1980s and 1990s, uh, which also disrupted the flow and the stability of families and, and, and individuals in this community. And the third wave of calamity would be the dismantling of the economy in South Africa, and I would say globally, thanks to globalization, etc., where employment and so on really declined, and people who used to work in the cities do not have employment anymore, and they are forced to come back to Patini to live there. So it acts also as an, as an absorber, a shock absorber of the, dyna the dynamics of the global, of the global uh, economy. Uh, and, and, and of course, there are many other waves of, of calamity that have visited this place, including the HIV AIDS crisis of the 1990s, and also the daily humiliations of apartheid that we know so well in this country that still continue to affect uh, uh, this, this community. So, so, so uh, Brittany's emphasis on the continuing uh, uh, histories and, and presence of coloniality in South Africa is, is pertinent, especially in this community. So in addition to working the land and attempting to sustain my own family on a rugged slope, I spend time examining what exactly working with members of what we call ILIMA, so working together of these farmers together uh, to help one another in producing food and other things. Uh, I use my membership in this small group of agroecological farmers in Pateni, and I probe the following questions. What do we miss when we only think of agroecology as ecologically sound food production? What are the things that people do when they farm? When small-scale farmers appear to be merely scratching, the, scratching about the land, in Murray's apt term, what exactly are they engaged in? So one of the elders that I interact with answered this question this way. I quote, this work for me is about changing the cassette. You can see it's an elder, it's an elder, yeah. This work for me is about changing the cassette, playing a different song. When I started farming two decades ago, Pateni was soaked in blood. I continually use farming to turn it green, to turn Pateni green. That's what this is about. We are telling a story about us, about this place. 
So this is what brought me to think about agroecology then as narrative. In short, my paper battles with the limiting genres of extend agroecological thought in South Africa going beyond the dominant story of agroecology merely as conscientious food production, I present the story of agri agroecology as multitudinous of agriculture as narrative. So I draw from the work of Sylvia Winter on conquest, especially her concepts of the plantation and the plot, and I examine these farmers' engagements with place, with history, with each other, in their attempts to self-trope this is the, the word that Winter uses, the concept that Winter uses, self-troping through narrative reconfigurations of farming in Patini. So my key protago protagonists are the projects themselves. Uh, the screen is, is acting up, so it's blocking some of my... So the, the top name there is Emma Siswin. So the name of this project, a young woman who, she's in her 40s. Um, I'm, I'm, so I call people who are 40 now young people. Um, she's in her 40s, and she started her project about two years ago, and she started off by calling it, by naming it as an elegy to her father who was butchered in the 1990s. And after a few months of talking with her, she changed the name of the, of the project from her father's name to Emma Siswin, which to those of you who know Zulu will know is returning to the source is the name of a, of a project. Uh, so this is, this is a project and we, we meet once a week as part of the group to, to help one another in, in our various ag 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 agricultural projects. So Emma Siswani for her, her project then for her, the story that she tells is the story of going back to the source for her. Here's another guy, uh, Tobani. His uh, project name is called uh, Lulu Chekaze. The computer is acting up, so oh, there it is. Um, yeah, Tobani farms on a small plot, about 50 meters by 20. Um, this is her aunt's plot. He finished metric two years ago and could not find work, and he started this project and he called it Lulu Chekaze. To the Zulu speakers, Zulu speakers will know Zulu, Lulu Chekaze is maybe freely translated would be, I made you look. So the idea is that for him, farming is about beauty, it's about aesthetics, it's about him being there. So that as he is on the side of the road, people would turn, break their necks, and look at what he's doing. Lulu uh, Here's another young farmer, Peggy. His project name is Ugwenza Wako. Uh, I focus on names because that's just how the narrative develops with the way that these farmers present themselves is through the namings of their projects. So Ugwenza Wako, this is your doing, <laughs> says Peggy. He's 23 years old, 23 years, 23 years old also. Uh, he is using both his ancestral land, which is very, very small, plus also the land of the neighbor. And he says, for him, Ugwenza Gwako is about owning what you love, putting yourself in the middle of it. In other words, to recognize that in practice, your life depends on your own stated commitments. Uh, some, some deep philosophical stuff going on there uh, that I don't have time to, to really dwell on. But in the, in the name that Peggy develops for his project, he says this is what he is, is, is asserting, that you, you, you are, that the world is the way it is because of you. So that's what he wants to do with his work. And, and then I will insert myself here. This is our project, uh, Bonagute. We called it Bonagute um, in the sense that it's about the, the place those of you, as some of you are here, have visited our little project in Patini. Uh, the views are amazing, so Bonagute, we talk about the views. But also Bonagute, importantly, refers to casting your eye, your one eye, back into the past while your other eye is cast into the future. So to see far, back and forth. 
So, so this is the idea and the meaning of, uh, this is what the, the present is all about. It's about looking into history and also while you're casting your eye, your eye ahead. Um, I, I conclude then by saying that the, the, the work that we do in Pateni and the way that I read it, uh, I read it not through the prism of development, not even the prism of alternative development, but through that forgotten concept of conquest which is defined by uh, South African philosophers Ramos and Mudiri as not a historical event, but an ongoing regime of settler colonial white supremacy that is characterized by paradigmatic violence, land dispossession, and exploitation. But since it is an enduring structure, not an event, conquest must be understood as constitutive of physical, structural, and symbolic violence that serves as the foundation of the very coherence of South Africa. So conquest is what we are up against. So yet, as Winter points out, conquest also has double, double narrati narratability. The fact that it contains both the stories of the, con the conqueror and the stories of the conquered. It allows then people in the small plots of Patini to present an alternative narrative that allows farmers to declare through their action and the naming of their projects, that they are inferior to nobody. Uh, this is what Winter calls self-troping. Agriculture as cassette, as narrative, is not simply about the cultivation of plants for nutritional, economic, or even ecological purposes. It unwinds, rewinds the cassette, and records over it. So one of the ways to see this type of farming then is to see it as an attempt to liberate oneself from the incarceration of history, to use Fanon's app term, and turn yourself into a human being, or changing the cassette of the story of your life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mvu, for such an inspiring um, presentation. I don't know if anyone has seen The Last Seed, which, was, um, which is sort of currently on the circuit. It's, won a lot of awards, and Mvu is in it, and he's, he's definitely the star of that movie. <laughs> I urge you to see it. Thank you so much, Mvu. We've got time for a, a quick round of um, questions before we move on to the next set. Any questions for Mvu and Brittany? It's not a question, it's, just, it's a comment. Yeah. Just is a colonial term in itself, and I think we've just heard, particularly from Mvu, that uh, that's very far from the case, yeah. Yep, Clara. Hi, thanks for really interesting presentations. So I was just wondering, uh, reflecting over the two presentations together, uh, when we first heard about the dis disruptive effects of colonialism, uh, or since the beginning of colonialism until now, on, on smallholder farming, and then in the second presentation on some really vibrant smallholder farming going on. And I'm thinking that these, like this farm that we see here now, it's not, it's not really, it's not an individual success, but it must be, uh, there must be a collective around this farm that makes this possible. Can you say something about that? Because uh, in relation to how these collectives uh, and social cohesion has been uh, disrupted over a long period. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really smart observation because this is not possible without a, a working together, not only among people, in our case, in our project, it's working with a number of other farmers in terms of, say for example, seed saving and seed collection. Um, because you, you cannot do this on your own. It's just not possible. The attainment of land, we are still lucky in, 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 in this area that 
you don't buy land. So even the attainment of land requires you to have good relations with uh, the traditional leaders and the community around you. Because if you don't, you, there's no way you can have a plot of land like that to, to operate. And so it's the collective work uh, so self roping then is a collective exercise because you depend on the other people around you in order to make it possible. So Ilima, for example, that I described earlier on, due to lack of time, I couldn't really dwell on it, is this idea that we rotate work once a week to go to various projects, to help one another, again, to go against that, the value of profit that Brittany talk, talked about earlier on to work for ourselves without pay to help one another in order to, uh, to recreate the, the space and to produce projects that are beautiful like that by working together. So if there are eight of us working for two hours every week, that's 16 hours of labor. When you put eight, to, eight people together like that, those, those, those 16 hours are more than 16 hours because of the collective action that is involved there. And not only, you're not, you're not only working the land, you are talking, you are singing, you are thinking together. So it, it, does, it does produce, uh, I would say, magic when you, when you do it like this. Um, so that collective idea is, I would argue, at the center of the possibility of this kind of, this kind of work. Thanks, Mvu. We are going to move on because we have very little time, but hopefully at the end we can pick up some more. Um, Morgan's now going to, Morgan Lee is a PhD student at UCT. She's going to be telling um, a story as well, but from a very different part of South Africa, as you were here. Cool. Um, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so my research is focused on um, socio-technical transitions. And more specifically, I'm looking at the lock-in of agrochemicals or pesticides into the commercial grain farming sector. So very different um, type of farmer in a very different sector than what we've been speaking about. And my presentation today is in a storytelling format, and it's intended to give you a glimpse into the mindsets of commercial farmers operating in the sector and an insight into the pressures of the um, close-knit and closely guarded uh, commercial agricultural sector. Um, and the story takes place at an event called NAMPO, which is a big agricultural exhibition that takes place in the Free State um, every year. Cool. So, you arrive at the gates of NAMPO at 7 a.m. on the first day. Your early ar arrival was an attempt to beat the queues, but as you walk closer, you see almost 80 people lining up already. The weather is freezing and the wind blows cold, but you stand confidently in your shorts and your fellies. Nampo is the largest private agricultural exhibition in the Southern Hemisphere, where roughly 800 exhibitors present the latest innovation and technology in crop and livestock production to almost 82,000 visitors over four days. Despite the long queues, you know it is worth your while to attend. As you emerge from the gates, you see hulking pieces of bright yellow machinery loom above you, the latest harvesters and sprayers from New Holland, with their million rand price tags fluttering in the breeze. Seeing the giant combine harvester reminds you of the precious time you're losing while attending Numpo. It's harvesting season, and any day now, your maize will dry out to the required moisture level and, you'll, and will need to be harvested immediately. Pushing the thought aside, you order a coffee and a burble swirl, and you head towards the main area of the event. You pass by the Bayer, Panna, Pioneer, and Cortiva AgriScience stores with their brightly colored insecticide-treated seeds and proud displays of genetically modified yellow and white mealies. You sigh as you remember the quote from your agent for these herbicide-tolerant and insect-resistant seeds. The yield from these seeds will be higher, but so too will your input costs, and you try to ignore the size of the loan needed from the bank to prepare for next season. Knowing that your tractor needs to be replaced, you head to the John Deere tent. Years of reduced profits and narrowed farm margins have resulted in the decline and poor maintenance of your tractor fleet. The tent is full of bright green machinery, from tractors the size of small houses to automated precision spraying equipment. A consultant quickly spots you and explains their financing plans and technological offerings. 
He asks if you're ready for autonomy, and then describes the latest digital agriculture and GIS solutions, where tractors drive themselves and your data on soil, seed, tillage, spraying, and harvesting is uploaded and analyzed by John Deere software right in the tractor. You thank the consultant, but shake your head. Not only is the equipment out of your budget, but you're concerned about the privacy and ownership of your farm data and who profits from it. The consultant is friendly as you decline, but he also says that you'll change your mind, that digital and precision agriculture is the future of commercial grain farming. He warns that this is the most profitable way to farm, and that if you don't upgrade, someone with more money and more land will buy your farm when you go out of business. You leave the tent feeling a bit flustered. The looming threat of losing the farm is constant, both economically and politically, and it makes you cautious. You've heard this all before, that the future of farming is digital, automated, and large scale. While you are a commercial farmer, you farm roughly 1,000 hectares. Your neighbor, on the other hand, farms 4,500 hectares, and has already begun investing in machinery you could only dream of affording. He's also told you about the bulk deals that he gets for his agrochemical products. Because your neighbor has a larger farm and a larger sprayer, he applies more agrochemical products. And because he buys in bulk, he is offered specials and deals through his agent that aren't offered to you. Your frustration grows. You're trying to reduce your input costs because the profit margins of the farming sector are constantly narrowing. You even have a study group with some friends in the area where you share information and results from your experimental plots. Plots where you're trialing new farming practices like minimum tillage or crop rotation, and even new agrochemical products or reduced agrochemical use. You're trying to balance this need for input reduction with more sustainable practices amidst the threat of losing the farm. But you can't do it all. Sometimes you wonder whether it would be easier to just sell to your neighbor. He's made the offer before because he farms at such scale with access to much bigger loans than you. He can afford to purchase his inputs as usual and farm conventionally. There's no reason for him to want to change his farming practices, and he continues to make a substantial profit. You think back to the tractor and its software that the John Deere consultant showed you. So many new technologies, agrochemical products, and farming practices have entered the sector. With such diversity, how are you meant to know everything? You can't be an expert in all of this. And as the technological and agrochemical diversity continues to increase, you find yourself relying more and more on external specialists. What is the impact of bringing external advisors onto your farm? How many relevant skills do you have left? And how much control over your own farm do you retain? The day has warmed and you're feeling grumpy, so you walk back to the main area and find the Grain SA Members Hall. Grain SA is a voluntary commodity organization that advocates for farmers and engages with government around farming challenges. As you enter, you start to relax. You see friends from farms across the Free State, and you greet each other boisterously. A free cold beer is placed in front of you as you sit down to unwind and catch up with old friends. While chatting, a friend describes how his neighbor tried to change farming practices. He describes how he tried to practice minimum tillage and reduced agrochemical use, but ended up losing his farm. Everyone shakes their heads, and you take a deep sip of your beer. You've thought of moving away from conventional farming practices. After all, you're very protective of your land, and you're starting to learn more about soil health from farmer days and the internet. But to change your system requires investments into new machinery that you can't afford, an initial yield decrease as your soil adjusts, which you also can't afford, and a lot of trial and error. Worse, if you fail, you'll lose the farm. With profit margins under pressure, there's no room for error. And now that you think about it, you've seen almost no information about alternative agricultural practices or even products at Numpo. You're surrounded by enormous sprayers, deep tillage machinery, and different stalls and trials showcasing genetically modified seeds. There are no trials showcasing alternative seeds or products or practices. Where would you find the information and the skills? How do you gain experience and who will catch you if you fall? There's also the market to consider. Last year, the fertilizer price increased by 200% because of the war between Russia and Ukraine. This year, the price of maize has dropped concerningly low because more maize was produced than expected. You think back to 2018, when the price of maize dropped dramatically due to a decrease in the price of oil. 
The maize price dropped so low that 16 farmers in the Free State committed suicide. Fluctuating markets, debt, machinery investment, yield declines, climate change, biased information, technological and agrochemical diversity. Changing farming practices in this context is an unquantifiable risk. As your friends laugh loudly, you're drawn back to the conversation. Someone just made a good joke about organic agriculture and vegetable farmers. You realize that moving away from conventional agriculture is more than just a system change, it's a social change too. You would lose your friends and be subject to ridicule. You would be the joke at the table rather than the vegetable farmer. You'd have no support. After all, your agricultural advisor is also your agrochemical supplier and a fellow conventional farmer and long-term friend. The farming network in South Africa is close-knit and decidedly conventional. To remain included and respected in the commercial farming world means going along with the advancements put forward by the agrochemical and equipment industries. And at this point, you're not sure if you're willing or even able to risk losing this network of support and friendship. Finishing your beer, you decide to take one final loop of the Nampo grounds. The sun is low in the sky and the air is cold again. You watch the prize cattle being walked back to their pens and you marvel again at the sheer size of the event around you. You walk past an exhibit called Bura Plana, which translates to farmer plans. It's a competition and innovation and it showcases the unique modifications made by farmers themselves to their own farming equipment <clears throat> in order to tackle unique farm challenges. While Bura Plana is only one exhibit, it is representative of the whole event, maybe even the whole commercial farming sector. It showcases farmers from their own perspective as innovators and custodians. It is a display of farmer resilience and tenacity in the face of adversity and change. Farmers in South Africa do not have the best reputation, but it is events like Nampo that make you proud to call yourself one of them. Yeah, that's that. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Morgan. Very profound story. Um, and I think it also I mean, just characterizes the dualism that we, we have in South African agriculture, from sort of Mvu's story to the story that Morgan has just told. Um, I'm going to move now to, to Maya Marshak. And Maya, um, once I find your presentation here, is um, completed her, her PhD a couple of years ago. I only see myself. Where's the presentation? There we go. Looking at um, at de-skilling, and I mean, there's quite a lot of literature around de-skilling among farming communities, smallholder farming communities, in particular. But Maya has taken a very unique perspective on de-skilling and looking at it from the perspective of the scientists and how scientists have become de-skilled. So Maya, this is over to you now. Hi. Um, so I hope I'm going to find my words because I've, like Mbu, been farming the last few years and haven't been giving presentations, but that's my disclaimer. Um, so um, this work is called, uh, well, this presentation, Mapping May Seed Research and Relational Knowledge. Um, Rachel already uh, interviewed that. Uh, already said that it was part of my PhD work, which was linked to the Saatchi Bioeconomy Research Chair at UCT, supervised by Rachel Weinberg and also Dr. Fern Wixon. And it was also linked to a project called the Agriculture's Project, which was in South Africa and Spain, funded by Genoc. And um, the idea was to look at um, developing novel concepts and methods for understanding and assessing relational networks connected to agricultural biotechnologies. And in South Africa, I, uh, my research interpreted this, interpreted this through looking at the social ecological impacts of GMAs. And I looked at this on two uh, areas. One was on smallholder farms um, in an area near Pongola in northern KZN. And here I interviewed farmers and spent time learning about how the introduction first of hybrids and then GMOs had um, 
uh, sort of impacted on social ecological relationships with place and um, and uh, agroecological knowledge and practice. Um, I'm not focusing on that in this research, but I wanted to bring it in because I feel that it's really important for me these two areas of research together, the space of research and development and the space of smallholder farming because of the uh, complicated and difficult history in South Africa between these spaces. Um, so within the research and development space, um, I spent a lot of time uh, in research and development institutions, both in public and private research, um, looking at, again, honing in on the kind of the way that specifically GMAs, as it come in uh, to that space, had played a role in shifting agroecological focused research. I don't think I should use the word agroecological more, though I, I saw it as ecological based research, um, and that was not research. That was basically broadly, like I saw these spaces as kind of a laboratory ecology, like the ecology which scientists were engaging with. And of course, that's uh, also complicated as science is very political. Um, but I don't have time to get into that. So um, that's just an aerial view of different research and development spaces over South Africa. And you can see just from looking at those lens, those images, what kind of science informs that kind of landscape. Um, so in terms of concepts and methods, um, the wider agriculture's project came from a sort of science and technology studies space. Um, and within the context of South Africa, I drew on a lot of post-colonial science and te technology studies research, which looks at the history of science and technology in the context of southern, the global south and the role that sciences and technologies have played in colonial systems and systems of power. Um, that I, I've sort of placed these bodies of work together and overlapping, but there are also lots of contradictions between these bodies of work. But I think that brought for interesting material to work with. And the, the decolonial studies was really important in thinking th through the kind of history of colonial science and uh, hierarchies of knowledge and thinking th different ways of knowing and uh, interacting within the agricultural space. Um, then I drew in some post-humanist studies, which also there's a lot of like contradictory work, work in, against, or sort of in that space to, to work with. Um, but I kind of drew on the multi-species ethnography stuff, which, which is looking for ways to think about our relationship with agroecosystems. I think that in relation with decolonial studies becomes an interesting set of stuff to work with. Um, just very briefly, I wanted to give a history of maize research and development in South Africa, from um, firstly from open pollinators to hybrids in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, at this time, you see that maize really gets earmarked as a, 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 like an, a crop that has infinite potential. So um, you hear of European corn brokers in the early 1900s talking about South Africa as the future granary of Europe. Um, and this idea that at this time, science of maize becomes a colonial science and a science of ag agro in, uh, agronomic visions and ways to control landscapes and to maximize profits and to extract as much as possible. In 1910, we see the first like, very popular hybrid, which is called the Pochestrum pearl. It was an accidental hybrid, but it became really popular in the 1920s and 30s. Um, in the 1925, the government set up a hybrid breeding station in Pochestrum, and this was the beginning of a push towards like, the government really pumping resources and capacity into um, hybrid breeding. So from the 1930s, you start to see some really significant shifts towards the commercialization of maize seed and hybrids. In 1937, there's the Marketing Act and then the Maize Control Board. And these are all instruments of power and of um, securing maize as a commodity. Um, you see this working hand in hand with the, the um, support of uh, research and development towards white cooperative farmers. Um, and just how much resources were pumped into supporting those farmers, both in terms of um, financially, but also in terms of research and development. Uh, in 1958, we see the first private seed company, which is Panar. Um, and this is a really significant moment. You can start seeing how seed is starting to become a commodity and something very with private commercial interests. There's the Seed Foundations Act in 1968. And, um, 
all of this, including the Prince Breeders Act, which comes in 1963, is all around um, like securing the financial rights of breeders. I'm not going to go into all of that. Um, then in, from hybrids to GMOs, from Pompati to democracy, there's this uh, moment um, in the late 1990s when GMOs are released commercially. But there's a much deeper foundation to that. You start seeing the kind of political financial structures for that already coming in. 1979, Say Gene was established, which um, establishes structured legitimacy and um, the kind of political structures needed to put GMOs forward. Um, and then the transition to democracy, we see multinational seed companies coming more and more into um, the country, t uh, taking up more space. Um, they, they're interested in this growing market of smallholder farmers who have been previously marginalized by this uh, research and development system and this commercial seed industry. Um, and the idea that maize is a, uh, is a staple crop in South Africa, which is also very appealing in terms of styling lots of seed. Um, and you start to see a restructuring of this research and development space, which um, starts to move more towards, uh, in line with global trends, starts to move more towards um, research out of the public sphere and into the private sphere. And the, uh, the yeah, into private seed companies, and you see a, a migration of skills and research moving towards the private research, and you also see, um, obviously with that, the shifting of priorities around research. Um, so I think it's important to mention that that time, time before uh, transition to democracy was a strange time in which there was a lot of what I've sort of seen broadly as ecologically more um, Place-based research in in this R and D space, obviously focusing on very small number of white farmers, but the you see like extension offices working on projects in real time and space with farmers and starting like that kind of relational knowledge. But when things open up, it's this double thing of privatization of research and also the kind of restructuring and the, the unraveling of capacity. You never see that kind of research transitioning into the wider group of smallholder farmers that the government is now working with. Um, so going back to the multi-species kind of lens, uh, very early on insects kind of emerged in this research space as interesting collaborators. Um, that one of the first research trips I found this kind of old dusty cabinet of um, moth-eaten moths. And it got me thinking about what was shelved, like what research had got sidelined and didn't exist. And in one of the interviews that I did with this, I tried to interview as many people who had been there for a really long time as possible in different institutions. And one of the interviews um, I'd been told by uh, how they were, I also saw the logbooks, they were collecting um, moth flight patterns of these stem borers over like 30 years. And, and they got to a point where they could know the life cycle enough to, in order to reduce pesticides use because they would know when there was going to be an outbreak. And so there's this really complicated kind of interesting research happening. Um, and so I was looking at how, like how that kind of research was shifting with the introduction of GM. One of the, the kind of key protagonists in this insect story was the stem borer, which anyone who grows maize knows it's a very voracious pest in the maize industry. Um, in maize farming. And um, this insect, yeah, so th they'd been mar mar uh, tracking these Mark 5 patterns, and all of this had been happening. Um, and then I was told by the scientists the day that BT maize came in, a lot of that research just really started to fall along the wayside. So uh, Monsanto was also very interested in this insect. It was kind of the post insect for BT maize because um, BT maize has a toxin in it which kills that insect. So that immediately removes the need to have to know much about that insect if the maize is doing it all itself. So um, that's, yeah, that's, that's, I saw a lot of these stories of like changing priorities in research around the kind of way that maize, uh, this GM maize had different priorities. So um, one scientist said to me, the day that GM, GM was announced, it all stopped because there was an answer to everything. So all the resources were channeled towards doing contract work on multinational companies, screening their GM events, and so on. 
IPM died, Integrated Pace Management died within a matter of a few years. Um, in my opinion, that was a huge change in the maze and cotton research because now the paste was gone. So that's, I mean, that's, it's not, it wasn't all gone, but that, that's just showing the kind of frustration that was starting, I, I found with a lot of research that had got kind of sidelined. So um, and Rachel mentioned I was working with the idea of agricultural de-skilling, and there's much uh, kind of a history of this research around um, Fitzgerald in 1993 uses it to talk about the skills and practices lost in the maize, industry, maize farming in, in America, and Stone talks about it um, in India with, with GM cotton and, and how that changed farmer skills. Um, I, try, I adapted it a little bit to talk about ecological de-skilling just to hone in and that, those kind of that element of, re of research. Um, and then just to end, I thought I'd talk about the Paul Armyworm who um, came, kind of felt like, to me, a harbinger of this need to think about reskilling and research. And for reskilling and research, I think I mean finding that, that kind of more place-based relational research, but also thinking about what that means in terms of agroecology and the future of research in South Africa and the priorities that we give that research. Um, so that big mess on the left-hand side was something I found in one of the research institutions. Uh, this full army worm had just come, there'd been two years of drought, and everyone was really stressed out about how this was going to eat everything. Um, yet there wasn't much knowledge about how to deal with this insect in this context, as it was new and a kind of an invasive new insect. Um, uh, there weren't even people, that many people in the country who could identify it. I walked into an office of one person who was one of the only people who knew how to identify it, and she was sitting with these piles of samples that she was upset about because nobody knew how to pin an insect or how to preserve a sample, or, and so it was kind of chaotic. But what was really interesting in that moment was the awareness around the fact that we couldn't... So previously, this idea of GMAs had been kind of come to see us like a silver bullet solution. And there was really an awareness at this time that silver bullet solution, solutions are not what we need to deal with something like this, that there's a real need to kind of reclaim these integrated methods and to find more space for that. So what I was um, wanting to end with is how can insects guide ecological reskilling in R&D and also bring it back to this node around my other research around smallholder farming and thinking about like, what is the role of public research um, in the context of reskilling, reconnecting with place, and doing that in a different way than has been done historically, which, uh, yeah, has a, the history that we've all been talking about. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Maya. And I can't, can't help thinking about the contrast between what you're presenting and what, uh, my, what uh, Morgan presented, sort of with the precision agriculture and things heading much more towards uh, sort of that automated state. Wonderful presentation, thank you. We're going to have a short input now from, from Jen, who's put together a video together with, with Maya and with Heidi Swanby, linked to uh, sort of questions around genetic modification. And then we'll end off with Witness and Rachel Besnikur talking about the Zimbabwean and Malawian context. So stay with us, please. Um, Jen. Hello. Um, yeah, thanks, Rachel, for the introduction. Um, so this is a, a short video. It's a, a very condensed version of um, a chapter for the agroecology book. Um, that Rachel was speaking about um, by my by myself, um, Maya Marshak, and Heidi Swamby, and it kind of just incorporates um, our research interests, looking at sort of history and politics of of science in South Africa, and also looking at two alternative um, food ways and activism. Um, so yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Um, I'm just going to press play. The interests of marginalised small farmers, but are considered in the complex and harshly unequal context of South Africa. Modern science has served the needs of capital accumulation and political gain. Our analysis emerges through engagement with the ontological term and deep learning theory to shed light on the hidden 
dynamics of modern scientific knowledge production in the global sector. Science-based risk assessments are central to decision-making in the markets in South Africa. Scholars and activists have drawn attention to the narrow frame of early risk assessment approaches and the ways in which this has enabled their efficient beliefs into agricultural landscapes. While broadening the scope of risk assessment is a common, there is a need to move beyond this and look at the ontological underpinnings that inform and legitimise risk assessment and the decision-making processes in the way. We hope to show how modern science and politics have intertwined to legitimise risk assessment as a neutral regulatory tool and unravel how scientific authority reflects a particular set of biases and assumptions that both legitimise GM crops in South African agro-ecosystems and risk assessment as the best means to assess them. Since the 1960s, the objectivity of modern science has been increasingly questioned. Modern science can be traced back to the European Enlightenment during the 16th century, where the idea that humans can uncover the laws of nature and control it for their benefit to these ideas were premised on the separation of humans from nature, and accompanying this was the belief that European scientific knowledge was superior to other ways of knowing the world. But ontological turn has arisen across disciplines in the past few decades to oppose the centrality of these modernist ways of knowing and being, and has shown how science, like all bodies of knowledge, is situated, socially and culturally specific, and imbued with ideological agendas. Decolonial theories trace how modernism and colonialism, beginning in the 15th century, were co-constituted. And through imperialist expansion, this mode of thinking spread and was forced from societies across the globe. They have shown how modernist science has both appropriated other ways of knowing and subjugated them, whilst claiming superiority due to the perceived rationality of science. Decolonial theories describe the ongoingness and unfinished nature colonial modes of thinking and systems of power that continue to oppress our relational ways of knowing and being in the world. De Souza Santos argues that marginalised ways of knowing that are often indigenous, local or gendered are very often dismissed as superstitions, subjective opinion and as lacking in the Through an ontological lens, scientific rationalism is understood as one way of being in and knowing about the world, but not the only one. Backed by political power and capital, this knowledge system has come to have damaging effects on more relational ways of being in the moment. Through colonialism, apartheid, and into the new democracy, agricultural development has been entwined in these systems of power. Such systems supported white commercial farmers through investment, research, development, and technology, whilst marginalising black smallholder farmers through oppressive landlords and unequal access to agricultural systems. The establishment of an organisation called SAG in the late 70s was a turning point in the creation of this landscape receptive to GM crops. SAG was a group of scientists who developed the guidelines for the use of GMOs and it also included members of the biotechnology industry with vested interests. This techno scientific structure went on to shape how GM crops would be governed in South Africa. After the transition to democracy, this approach to managing GMOs continued as South Africa further opened up to the influence of multinational companies. At the international level, the Cartagena the Protocol for Biosafety came into effect in 2000, leading the global trajectory of GM regulation and was adopted by South Africa that same year. Negotiators from the Global South articulated the urgent need for transboundary regulation and the sovereign right to regulate this technology, as well as measures to counterbalance the narrow economic principles of the WTO. While the final protocol was not as comprehensive as many countries in the Global South had wanted, it was broadly perceived by them as a victory. However, while some negotiators pushed for the inclusion of a broad concern, Modernist scientific principles and ways of knowing remain central to the protocol, which states that it adheres to strict observance of scientific information. As a result, it tends to treat non-scientific matters of concern, like cultural or ethical concerns, as peripheral or additive. We suggest that at play here is an ontological battle between extractive ways of knowing and being in the world, and more relational ways of knowing and practicing in relation to nature and biodiversity. At present, Biosafety South Africa defines risk assessment as a structured approach to 
in turn have a chance of harm from activities with particular GMO, based on scientific evidence by consideration of what could go wrong and how this may occur. It seems very simple, yet yeah, there's a lot at stake. Managing GM crops using risk assessment is well established in countries that have adopted this technology, but it's also been criticised even by natural scientists themselves. Concerns centre on its independence, its suitability for decision making, the limited range of risk assessment, the legitimacy of the science behind the risk assessment, issues with substantial equivalence, and its inability to deal with uncertainty and assess alternatives. We want to hone in on ontological dimension and untangle some of the assumptions that come with the science-based risk assessment. Firstly, embedded in are two fundamental separations. The first is the separation between humans and nature, and this is reflected in the way a risk assessment separates the evaluation of risk to human, animal and environmental health on the one hand, and largely dismisses the social, economic, cultural and political dimensions of risk on the other. The second separation is between science and society, reflected in the GMO Act where science-based risk assessments are managed by a scientific advisory council, and policy-based risk management is governed by an executive council. As risk assessment is commonly seen in the domain of pure science, anything that addresses social concerns are seen as lying outside of it. Scholarship of decolonial feminist theory has in varying ways articulated how modern science reflects the values and narratives of the society in which it came to exist. And thus we argue that scientific risk assessments are inevitably and actively framed by and judgments. Lastly, we question whether these dominant models of science-based risk assessments that build on these reductionist dualisms are capable of assessing the relational consequences of agricultural biotechnologies in the global south, where most of the world's biocultural diversity is located. An example of this incompatibility lies in GM crops that are engineered to be herbicide tolerant. These crops are said to reduce herbicide applications and better control weeds, with the benefit to coming from planting the GM crop and spraying it with herbicide. It's like a package deal. Yet, when assessing the risk of planting herbicide tolerant GM crops, the herbicide that it's sprayed with is not considered part of the technology and is thus assessed by separate pesticide regulations. In South Africa, if the use of the herbicide has been previously authorised, then the safety of the herbicide with the GM crop is assumed, and no assessment of multiple herbicide applications over time is required. In addition to this, the herbicide itself is further reduced into its constituent parts, with only the active ingredient being subject to regulation. Similarly, the way in which the principle of the refuge is implemented demonstrates how the presumed rationality of scientific risk assessment cannot reliably assess the true nature of risk in an environment that is constituted by a myriad of social and ecological relationships. A refuge is a portion of the farmer's field that is planted with non GM seed adjacent to the GM crop with the aim of delaying insect resistance. The farmer commits to planting the refuge in a legally binding agreement signed with the industry when buying the seed. But the theoretical principle of the refuge does not account for on the ground realities. For example, studies have shown that smallholder farmers often don't plant a refuge because they're either unaware that they need to or that it's too laborious and time consuming. The impracticality of refuge design for small scale farms also complicates its management, and the accurate compliance of the future would not be easily implemented without significantly changing agricultural practices and landscapes. Running short on time, but I'm going to allow one or two questions just in relation to the last three three presentations before we move on to witness and, and Rachel. Any questions? Thanks a lot. Um, so this was for the R and D presentation. Um, I'm a bit inspired. I've read uh, Wilted by Julie Guthman, and, and she uses the concepts of threat and repair. To, to look at how um, the strawberry industry in California has evolved over time. And she talks about how things have also evolved over time. So the kind of uh, the fields and the strawberry plants and the pests were, are not the same today as they were in, in the past. Um, and I wonder, are there any ways in which this also comes out in, in, in your work? How this co-evolvement of, 
of plans and responses and knowledge regime kind of comes together over time? Yeah, very much. Thanks for mentioning that. I think that there is this kind of conversation that I had with both scientists and farmers about how the landscapes which they used to know have changed. Um, to the point that there aren't even, like within the space of science, there aren't even really baseline studies on things like insects and weeds. Like one chemical scientist told me that there'd been a new weed that had come into the field like for years and no one had known until it started to take over and, they, and then they realized it wasn't what they thought it was, it was a new species. <laughs> Um, and you, you said there's a lot of that going on. But actually there's an interesting project now I heard about in the, um, happening in the Kruger Park, which is a survey of the insect species. And I, I think there's more of this need to think about what exists in the landscapes and like what it means to think relationally in landscapes that are fractured in all these different ways. <laughs> like, um, I think that's why there needs to be a relationship between farmers on the ground and researchers more and more. Thank you, Maya. Any other questions? Yes, at the back. Uh, thank you for the uh, presentation, especially uh, I thought Morgan, your presentation was very profound. Um, I guess it comes to a, a practical question, both for subsistence farmers who go into uh, commercial agriculture and, commercial, and then smallholders who are stuck in commercial agriculture and trying to exit. What is the, you know, the practical alternative to you know, being dragged into market relations for everything else in your life? So for education, for food, for fuel, for healthcare, meeting those debt repayments, meeting those household incomes, with an agricultural livelihood which satisfies them, right? Because it's, they're, they're facing a very, um, I mean, I've experienced this in my field work in South India, which is they're facing a very constrained set of conditions, right? So what is the, kind of, how would you respond to a farmer who says, okay, this is great, but the transition time to, tr to move away to agroecological um, methods or you know, the need to repay my debt immediately in the short term and, you know, how, how do you kind of reconcile that and what's, what's the, I guess, the, the steps that we need to encourage that in policy? Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a difficult, difficult one that reconciling um, what's, what's currently happening and what needs to happen amongst the current day pressures that uh, farmers face. But I don't have a, a straight up answer for you, but one thing I did experience was that farmers trust other farmers the most. So if you can show them evidence of some other farmer who has done what you're trying to advocate for, especially in their area or relatively close by, it, it tends to, to uh, they have more faith in it than if a scientist from a university comes to them and he's like, oh, look at agroecology, you should try this and these practices. So yeah, I mean, that's the only reconciliation I've seen is if you can actually show a farmer um, in his own area where what you're trying to show him has actually worked. Yeah. Thank you, Morgan. I'm sure that... Um I'm sure over at T also you can continue these conversations, but I'm going to move on to witness now, witness Kozunayi, who's based at the Morandera University of Agricultural Science and Technology in Zimbabwe, and was at UCT at, for, for a long time. He's very much part of the UCT family. Um, he's going to talk about cyclone Adai in, in Zimbabwe and uh, how agroecology fared. Okay, thank you. I'm um, last, but probably not least. Uh, my talk is going to be on Cyclone Idai, which hit Southern Africa, Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Mozambique in, 2000 and in 2019. Winston Churchill is said to have once remarked that he never let a crisis go to waste, quote and unquote. So after Cyclone Idai hit Zimbabwe, 
together with colleagues, we went there to assess how, how agroecology had fared in the face of that natural disaster. All right. So why cyclone in Dai? We have had several cyclones in Zimbabwe, especially from the 1990s. Honestly speaking, I've lost count. And those who do modeling are telling us that we are in the corridor of cyclones, more are coming to hit us. Cyclone Idai, Idai stands out, you know, from the rest for the simple reason that it was the most destructive natural disaster in Southern Africa in living memory. There was loss of life, lives. Hundreds of people lost their lives, accounted for and unaccounted for. Flooding, landslides, infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure damaged to the tune of about $400 million if you are just looking at Zimbabwe. Crop and livestock loss, livestock, livestock, livestock loss disrupted, and food shortages, as you expect. So that was the cyclone Idai in magnitude. I'll briefly show you some photos to over-dramatize this point. So before Idai, there had been efforts to promote agroecology in some of the target communities in particular under the original program called Seed and Knowledge Initiatives with a number of uh, partners in Zimbabwe that are part of that program. In the case of Chimani Mani, the setting for this uh, talk, we have uh, two uh, organizations, Poret and Tsuro, that promoted uh, agroecology. I have there just a definition of what agroecology is for the uninitiated. I will not belabor you with the, the details, but basically it entails use of organic fertilizers, soil conservation works, use of farmer saved seed, social solidarity networks. It's not just the physical implementation of interventions, it's also about how people relate with each other and with nature. This is, you know, you know it's different from your conventional farming. Sorry, this keeps going to sleep. I hope it does. Okay. So it's opposed to, this is as opposed to conventional farming where you tend to have monocrop, monocropping, land tillage, and use of agrochemicals, which colleagues have already talked about. So that's the context. And then in terms of the setting, I've already hinted this talk is, of course, Cyclone Dai hit three countries, many places, but we are focusing on Chimani Man eastern part of the country of Zimbabwe, and uh, that's how the data used in this uh, talk was gathered, key informant interviews, observations. Let me also highlight that I happen to come from Chimani Man. I was born and bred there, so I had a good understanding of the area before Cyclone Idai and also after Cyclone Idai. A lot of reports were written about you know, Cyclone Idai focusing on different, different aspects. So there were a lot of uh, reports that we looked at and also distilled some insights. And then there was a household survey that was also carried out. So just, uh, so Cyclone Idai came and went, but not without leaving a trail of destruction. I have a few photos there for you to see, left to right in a clockwise direction, carpeting of homesteads by landslide, uh, cars same buried in borders, uh, bottom left, what remains of what was once a farmer field, a center bottom, a bridge and a road gone too soon before communities could reach, could access external support. Bottom right, what remains of what was once a home and a family. So that was Cyclone Idai in magnitude in terms of what the destruction it caused. So we went to the affected communities to assess how the agroecology had fared in the face of this natural disaster. So it involved, you know, just physical assessment of fields, those that were agro agroecologically farmed and those that were commercially farmed, conventionally farmed, also digging, you know, soil, soil, soil pits to get an understanding of uh, how much organic matter was there and uh, a bit of analysis of nitrates and what have you. And also areas, areas to, to get, get an, an understanding, understanding of how much, how much damage, damage the cyclone had caused. Cost. So that's what we did in essence. So our key findings, what did we find? Number one, farms under agroecological management were more resilient than conventional farms. This was in terms of, you know, when you look at the destruction that was there on, on the, on the, in the fields, in terms of soil erosion and whatever. 
So of the households that we surveyed, 817 in total, 29 of the farmers that were practicing agroecology indicated that their farms had been affected. And these are communal farmers, as opposed to 57 that were you know, doing conventional farming. We also looked at you know, like soil structure, fields that, uh, of farmers that were practicing agroecology had more organic matter which obviously are in promoted seepage and, you know, which resulted in less soil being washed away. Uh, even when you looked at, you know, infiltration rates, because we went in and, you know, did some tests on infiltration rates, farmers, you know, fields that where farmers were practicing agroecology, uh, infiltration was quicker. 18 minutes, 12 minutes, I think it was, all the water would be gone as opposed to conventional farming. You would take more, like, no, more long, longer for the water to infiltrate the soil. The soil was compacted. And then also, because when you look at the impact of um, cyclone, cyclone die, we also looked at uh, how help came into the, into the affected communities, uh, external help, and also how local people were able to mobilize their local resources, resources and, and uh, you know, pick, you know, pick themselves, themselves up. up. Uh, we, noted we noted that, that response, response from, from government, government and, and aid, aid agents, agents was, was, uh, agencies was late and in some cases inappropriate and at times it undermined community resilience. It was inappropriate in the sense that some of the, you know, some government and some aid organizations came with seed, seed, but, but it, it was, was not, not the appropriate, appropriate seed. You know, you are in a crisis and you, are, you have no choice. Everything is foisted on you. Seed that does not grow in your community, probably food, food that you will not ordinarily eat, is it's pushed in your direction. And also because roads were now, it, it had been swept away, aid came in too late. And this, this uh, 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 cyclone hit the community in March, mid-March about. And those, uh, and April, the rain season is already, is already telling, uh, telling off. And aid only came probably around April. So it was just academic. It, it, it didn't help in, in, a, in any way. The number three, what we also found was that uh, Local solidarity networks, which are promoted a lot under agroecology, provided the first line of uh, support. The local understanding was that if you didn't have, if you didn't have solidarity networks, you didn't need any, you didn't need enemies for your downfall. You needed people around you to pick you up, by way of providing you with food, uh, clothes, and even re rehabilitating your degraded field if you know it had been damaged. If you were in an island as it were, you would take long to pick yourself up or wait for aid that never came, uh, literally. And then in number four, a key finding was that elements of landscape agroecology practiced before the disaster pointed to the, to the, to the way towards a more resilient agrarian future in Chimaniman. I think this is what came out quite clearly from what we observed and also talking to people to say if we are in a corridor of cyclones, of disasters. If you are to survive, what you need is to adopt an approach like, uh, to adopt agroecology as an approach because when disasters hit, you tend to be more resilient, you tend to be hedged from this natural disaster. I think in terms of findings, those are the four findings that we found, or we found out. We can have, we can talk some more about this in detail. So by way of, uh, you know, giving some concluding thoughts. In order to plan for a more sustainable and resilient agrarian future, a holistic appreciation needs to be realized to better inform the design and implementation of land use and agricultural plans. Number two, a piecemeal approach to understanding impacts would overlook important and effective local level mechanisms for dealing with such disasters. Yeah, I think this came out quite clearly. You know, at the local level, there are rich, you know, initiatives to support each other and to farm the land. Uh, so we need to not for, to lose sight of this, you know, local level man, uh, mechanisms. And then in the last one, resilience should be viewed in social and biophysical terms. The temptation is high for us to promote, you know, interventions that are physical in nature, that are technical in nature, but that's not enough you still need to invest in social networks, in solidarity, you know, building solidarity, reinforcing solidarity among communities. Because when disasters strike, 
like it, Cyclone did, it died did in, the, in Chimani Man. First and foremost, you need your neighbor to pick you up before external support came. South Africa even came to support. On my last slide, I'll show you a photo of some, uh, it has gone to sleep, of uh, soldiers, you know, building a makeshift uh, bridge. I think there was, uh, there were soldiers from South Africa, but they only came too late. So I think that's all I can say. I see she is standing up. It's not being rude. She is trying to be fair on time. Thank you. Thank you so much, witness, um, for a very wonderful presentation, very insightful. We're going to have one more, and that's Rachel Besnaker joining us from Malawi. Um, and so please, if you wouldn't mind just going to, to tea a little bit later, it would be appreciated. So, yeah, Rachel Besnaker um, is, I think, very well known in the agroecological agro space. She's a professor at Cornell University and was also instrumental in founding um, the Soils Health and Healthy Food and Soils, Food and Healthy Communities, uh, which is an NGO in northern Malawi, which is also part of the Seed and Knowledge Initiative um, that Witness mentioned earlier, as is UCT. And um, unfortunately, Rachel can't be here because she is, she's at a sort of a parallel conference in Malawi on food and nutrition but um, we'll have some really interesting insights to share, I'm sure. Over to you, Rachel. Thanks, Rachel, and sorry for delaying everyone's tea um, after such rich uh, presentations. I'm honored to follow this uh, group of uh, presentations. I'm wanting to reflect on some long-term um, collaborative participatory research that I've done in Malawi. And uh, so, next slide. Um, the, um, the research I'm, or the presentation I'm giving today um, draws from a uh, photo voice project that I conducted with farmers who participated in. Um, they had received training on sort of agroecological principles and practices, and then they done their own experiments to decide what they wanted to try in their own farms. And then did farmer-to-farmer -farmer learning and exchanges. Um, and uh, so I then, next, next slide, um, I went to, uh, I was in Malawi last year for five months, and I worked with a group of 40 farmers who had been using agroecological practices for um, many years by that time. And I asked them, um, I invited them to participate in this, in this and they um, took the cameras back to their, their home and they took photographs to share their experiences with agroecological practices. And, um, and then we had focus group discussions where they, they um, we went through the photos that they had taken and they explained why they had taken those photos. And I also carried out um, 30 uh, interviews with uh, government representatives, NGOs, farmer organizations, and international agencies about agroecology. And I am sort of in the midst of analyzing these different data sets, very different data sets, obviously. Um, and so, next slide. The, the um, interviews that I conducted with uh, government representatives and NGOs and uh, farmer organizations, I found um, and this analysis was done with, with a group of us. We, we found um, three different contrasting narratives um, on agroecology. Um, and one that was uh, fairly uh, dominant was that agroecology is where poor farmers can afford inputs and it's a remnant left over from traditional farming. Some, uh, some of that narrative, uh, one version of that narrative was that it was a you know, positive adaptation under uh, difficult circumstances. circumstances. Um, another version of that narrative is that it's, it's, an, it's a trap that traps people in, in um, backwards farming. Um, and a different narrative that was also common was that uh, agroecology is complementary to industrial approaches and that the 
because of climate change, the agricultural practices are necessary, but it doesn't, doesn't replace um, conventional farming practices. And then uh, a third narrative, which was very uncommon um, from kind of key informants uh, in the interviews, was that it was a holistic alternative to the extreme conventional agriculture. Um, but interestingly, even in this narrative, um, there was this perspective that external actors were really needed to train farmers in agroecological methods. Uh, so um, uh, that's in contrast to the kind of uh, ideas of agroecology being uh, drawing on indigenous knowledge and indigenous practices, which is kind of core principle. Recording in progress. Um, so next slide. So now I'm going to kind of walk through the, the different photos, some of the photos and the themes that um, I've been finding in these photos. And why is that? So many, many of the photos were different tasks that people do, different practices they do, and, and uh, the sort of day-to-day -day agroecology, if you will. So for example, in this uh, farmer, um, Irene uh, Ziwa, uh, she had many photos where she showed, okay, here's me gathering the materials for making the compost, here I am with my granddaughters making the compost, here we are digging it and putting it in buckets, and here we are carrying it to the fields, and here we are, these photos, um, you know, this is the first stage where I took it from the, the shed behind, and I'm making compost because of climate change. So. And in many of the photos, they, they are depicting the kind of day-to-day -day activities, but then they, they spoke about it really building resilience in their lives um, to, to climate change and to other, other shocks that they experienced. So that was kind of one evening. Um, next slide. Another interesting theme, and, and kind of harkens to some of the earlier discussion about sort of multi, thinking about multi-species, what I'm seeing was of animals, um, goats, uh, chickens, uh, birds, and uh, sort of depicting kind of a relationship, their, their relationship or companionship uh, with animals. Uh, so this, this farmer, um, uh, Diamond Simon, si not Diamond, um, David Simon said, uh, these are my chickens. I took these photos because they're helping me by going through the field and eating the pests. You can't see the pests and the beans because the chickens are helping. Uh, so that was a, a, another um, common theme in, in the photographs. Um, next slide. And then building on uh, what uh, Witness was talking about um, in cyclone of uh, crop loss uh, from flooding um, or from pests. And so sharing kind of frustrations and challenges and worries associated with farming and um, agroecology uh, sometimes could, could help with that and sometimes couldn't. So the, the farmer to the, on the right hand side was uh, describing how his banana trees have been completely devastated by the floods. And he, he actually took another photo where he showed himself looking very worried. And he said that you know he was feeling really hopeless about the loss of his his crops from the flooding. But other farmers took photographs of pest damage and then talked about different strategies they were using for pest damage. So this was a challenge that they faced in farming, but they felt like they had some strategies from agroecology to handle those those challenges. So that was another another theme. Uh, next slide. And. You know, they took photos, some farmers took photos of new ways of being, a lot of sort of gender, what they call gender photos, um, and where they, men were doing laundry, or they were helping with cooking, or they were carrying firewood, and they, they saw this really as part of an agroecological shift. It wasn't just a shift in the field, but it was a new, a new way of being uh, in relation to um, their spouse in particular, particularly around sharing workloads and sharing responsibilities and and um, taking, you know, appreciating that, really seeing that is important and valuable. Uh, so that was uh, another another theme. Next slide. 
farmers also described a range of different experiments that they were doing and exchanging seeds and ideas with other farmers. So this farmer had gotten rice seed from another neighbor who had grown rice seed and he had admired that, uh, that crop. And he uh, then uh, was very successful in, in growing it. It's not commonly grown in this region of Malawi. And uh, so this was really innovative on his part. And he saw this as something that he was going to continue doing um, and uh, was excited about that. So that, that was another theme of this kind of ex experimentation, farmer exchange and innovation. Next slide. And uh, some farmers had let land go fallow and had had forests grow up and they had taken photographs of that as part of their agroecological practice. And they talked about forests really being crucial uh, for restorative reasons, the kind of bringing peacefulness and clean air, listening to the birds, uh, reducing the, the heat. And, and this is another theme, this kind of restoration. And uh, slide. Another interesting theme of the of the photographs were the friendship and, and uh, eating together. So people took photographs of them eating mangoes in the field or or chatting. And uh, they really see this as part of the agroecological practice, this this re relationality. So it's not just restoration of the land, but um, uh, and witness talked about this as well, the, the kind of restoration of of relations and building relations, building community as part of an agroecological sort of um, uh, mindset. Um, and then a last kind of common theme in the last two photos speak to this is, is kind of great pride in, in the accomplishment and achieving food security and repairing the land. So this woman took a photograph of herself clapping and, and she was very happy with how her maze had done and she wanted to really highlight that. And in the next photo, it's it's them having standing by very tall pigeon pea uh, fields and being really satisfied with how well they were growing and, and how, how good they were looking. So um, just to conclude um, in my uh, next slide, um, there's a real contrast between the ways that agroecology is seen by sort of experts, uh, key stakeholders uh, where they, they see it as uh, a leftover remnant of traditional practice or complementary, but not uh, able to fully replace industrial practices um, or as a, a holistic alternative, but one that requires expert knowledge to teach farmers. And, and farmers who had been using these practices for many years and who are themselves real experts in these practices, uh, their themes were around resilience, uh, restoration, autonomy, but also friendship and um, changing ways of being with one another and with, uh, and with nature, um, appreciating the companionship of animals, uh, appreciating the sort of beauty and uh, opportunity for reflection and in nature and, and feeling real pride and satisfaction in what they had achieved. So uh, it, I think it uh, speaks to really different um, experience of agroecology from those who are using these practices. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And I think, yeah, lovely threads throughout all the presentations actually around restoration, relationality. I mean, it's amazing, actually, because there's so many different perspectives, but they all seem to be gelling really, really well. So I know it is tea time, but, but we've, let's just have one or two questions. Um, it doesn't take that long to have a cup of tea. Yeah, question over one and two, and then we'll close. This, this may be a, a, a question which we can talk about during tea time. Uh, my name is Dan Brockington from um, University of Autonomous University of Barcelona. Um, I, when I talk to farmers in Tanzania, um, some of them, not all of them, but some of them will say, I am just a farmer. And the, the just meaning that, I could, that there are other more important things that I, I could be seen as. And others will not say that. They will not see themselves in that way. And I'd be really interested if the panelists could, could reflect on how the farmers they work with and live with see themselves in the world? Do they see themselves as, as part of a hierarchy or, or, or separate and autonomous from that? Thank you. Next question. I think that, that's a, 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 a question.
question to anyone who wishes to respond on the panel. Yes, and thanks. It's Patrick Bond, Johannesburg. I think the um, amazing uh, local solidarity could be augmented by uh, the sort of the, the moral strength of uh, Cyclone Ide or Cyclone Freddy uh, Malawi victims uh, in saying to the people who caused the problem, uh, the global north like myself, that that should be should be matched. I'm wondering if that's part of any advocacy to strengthen agroecology, given that local solidarity and mutual aid can only go so far. If you need stormwater drainage systems or those roads rebuilt, or if you need irrigation systems to contend with climate. Um, and I think that, uh, to me, is where, at least in Zimbabwe, the Center for Natural Resource Governance said, we don't trust the international aid that will go to Mtuli Nkube, the finance minister of Zimbabwe, you know, I'm sure, uh, or the Mnangagwa regime. So we'd like to see it being delivered directly. And the model that they use is the Ochevero Namibia basic income grant, where if you just reside in an area, an area affected by a climate catastrophe, then you get, you qualify for that big, that, that monthly grant. I don't know if that's something that uh, agroecology advocates have, have thought through, because in so many ways it's rural uh, producers and its women that um, do deserve the first cut of any climate reparations. And we do have this, especially Ochevero, where the German, the Lutheran Church and their biggest trade union, Iggy Metall, actually made a, a wonderful pilot that nobody has uh, done any uh, you know, cr uh, critique of. It's, it's, it's widely regarded. Jim Ferguson has a book on it, Give a Man a Fish, with a very telling title. I'm just curious if that comes into any of your thinking, witness, or other Rachel. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Any other burning questions? One more, and then we'll, we will hand it back. Thanks. Uh, I'm Flora Heide from Swedish Agricultural University. Um, it's not actually a question, it's just mainly a reflection comparing uh, this uh, dire story of the commercial farmer who's really locked into this agrochemical uh, high debt situation that is so common also in Sweden, uh, we see, and, and in South Africa. Uh, and the smallholder farmers who actually maybe have a huge potential to flourish uh, with regenerative agroecology practices because they have land and ma the main input is initial labor, which actually might, through collaborative approaches like Ilima, be uh, able to produce that. And then in the long run, there's very little input and, and that is what has been the problem uh, for them with when they are at the bottom of this other system. So I don't know, just maybe some, if somebody would like to say a positive uh, note on the, on the sort of potential of these approaches for smallholders. Thanks, Laura. Any, any takers from the panel? Witness. Th thank you. Uh, I want to make an effort to respond to your question, but uh, Vanessa, if you don't mind, you hold the brief for, for advocates within the SKI, SKI program, so probably you could also chip in. I, I think the uh, agroecology has proven to be a good approach, a philosophy, and a, a philosophy. so a case can be made for it and uh, especially regarding the, you know, the observation that solidarity networks really help in, in terms of, crisis, of a crisis. So it's something that we have also been talking a lot about in the SKI program because I'm part of that, uh, yeah, that, that program as well. So I'm sure that we, we, we are going to be focusing on that. There is momentum gaining. We are gaining momentum uh, uh, around that. Um, but let me also hasten to say much as we want to promote solidarity among communities, it's also not lost in me, especially in the case of Zimbabwe, that there are national level processes that are, and that, for example, you know, there is a lot of um, polarization of communities in Zimbabwe when it comes to along political lines, and that tends to negate efforts to promote anything that, you know, to promote sort of building of solidarity among communities. Thank you. 
Yeah, just a, a small reflection on the smallholder farmers seeing themselves as just farmers, whereas on a commercial scale they feel um, a lot of pride that they are farmers. So it's a completely different mindset to smallholders where they might consider just feeding their families as just being a farmer, whereas on the commercial scale there's this we feed the world, um, very strong and... Uh, yeah, a, a very proud narrative of, of doing that. So it's interesting how doing that at a household level isn't considered that important, but doing it as on, a, on a national scale is, at least in the commercial farmer's mindset. Um, yeah, I don't know if Mvu, you want to say more. No, I, I think I'll just respond to the question that was raised by Patrick over there. I, I, I think it's a really important question. And it also rhymes with my own auto-critique of agroecology that I don't think we do enough as a movement in terms of advocacy um, to raise the larger questions um, about how, because if the struggle is to be fought on many fronts, the plot, in my case, the small garden is a really useful site, but in my estimation it's not enough. Uh, we have to do a lot more than that in order to, to work at the larger question of conquest whether it's the questions of climate change, whether it's the question of reparations, whether it's the question of the economic structure, the culture, uh, the politics that limit the possibilities of farming in a productive, in a useful, in a liberating way. So those larger questions uh, suggest that a small-scale farmer can be reasonable. A small-scale farmer can be reasonable in a context that is totally unreasonable. So, yeah, so I would say that, and, and that, that's why then you have a small-scale farmer who sees themselves as just a farmer, because the unreasonable system that is determining one's relationships with one's preoccupations suggests that the thing that you do is totally useless. And therefore, without that larger dynamic change of the relations in the global system, in the national system, I don't think that we have a, a, we have a chance of actually changing from conquest to, to freedom, as it were. Thank you, Mvu. Rachel has her hand up, so I'm going to let her have the, the last word. Rachel, can you unmute and then... Um. Thanks for these great questions. And, you know, I think the farmer identity one, it depends maybe at sort of the moment of where that farmer's at and thinking about what they're in, in or it, it's not always that I'm just a farmer. I, I do think there's a long term history of marginalizing and denigrating farmers, in my small farms in particular, um, which is deeply racialized as well. Although a different, very different history than than South Africa, of course, connected. But um, but I think that also um, from our work together, uh, we found that farmers can take great pride in, in what they're achieving, even though they're just a farmer. So I think I think that that's a, you know, two sides of the coin, perhaps. But also when farmers feel more hopefulness about being able to actually be food secure and uh, have some sort of decent livelihood, they, they begin to to feel great pride in, in what they've achieved despite those difficult circumstances. I don't know if that answers your question, but I don't think it's one or the other necessarily. And in terms of climate reparations, I mean, there are social movements that are definitely clamoring for agroecology as part of a broader strategy, uh, including climate justice, you know, I think of ASA, for example, it's really spearheading that. Um, and I think that it's crucial to link questions of, you know, climate reparations and, and climate justice to agroecology, because without deep cuts in greenhouse gas emissions from the global war, it's going to be very difficult for farmers to sustain their livelihoods and their way of life um, in, in places like Norway and Norway and South Africa. So I, I think it's really crucial and I think it, it, it requires you know, alliances and, and building um, 
social movements around around this question. But I do see that happening in some in some circles, certainly with with ASA, for example. So thank you. Thanks, Rachel. And a big hand to all the panelists. I think it's been a really good session. And look forward to continuing the conversation.